Chinese President Xi Jinping has called controlling the coronavirus the most important task facing the world's second largest economy. As China continues the fight, what is the current state of the epidemic? How far away are we from the vaccine? And how are the potential and the controversy over the use of traditional Chinese medicine being evaluated in treating the novel coronavirus? We have more later on in this program. And that is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yue. But first of all, let's talk to our reporter, Xu Xinchen, who has been covering this from epicenter of the epidemic in Wuhan. So Xinchen, uh, we were told that two hospitals, special hospitals, the Ho Shan and the Lei Shan hospitals are, are, are supposedly to be built to combat the epidemic. One is already up and running, and the other is on its way. How can those two hospitals help contain the epidemic in Wuhan? Yes, Joe. Yes. So we know that there are two emergency hospitals have been built, and one of them is already taking in patients gradually, the Huo Shenshan Hospital, and there is another one, Lei Shenshan, which is set to take in hospital very soon, in one or two days' time. So both hospitals are using state-of-art technologies. Uh, a lot of them are very technical, but I'm, I'm taking one example right here. It's like all the words inside of those two emerging hospitals are what we call a negative pressure isolation word. What does that mean? That means the air pressure inside of the word is not as high as, as the outside. That will prevent the air from flowing from the word to uh, from out and that will prevent the virus from spreading further and in addition because both hospitals are designed to be specialized hospitals for infectious disease diseases so there are special pathway for medical staff and for patients so there will be the clean zone the semi-contaminated zone and there will be the contaminated zone so both two hospitals are not just you know, providing a better medical treatment to patients, but also protect medical staff there. And we've also seen a state of art breathing machines and all the other uh, monitors inside the uh, Huo Shenshan Hospital, which is already up and running, taking in patients gradually. Joe But obviously, uh, we have been hearing this is still not good enough because already there are over 20,000 reported cases, most of them in Wuhan. And uh, the Wuhan government has decided to turn some gymnasiums and convention centers into makeshift hospitals. Uh, what about those hospitals? Uh, are, are they able to provide basic medical treatment to those patients? In fact, I am standing right in front of these kind of temporary hospitals, and the one behind me is actually converted from. Uh, a stadium, the Hongshan Gymnasium uh, in the city's downtown area, the Wuchang district to be exact. And uh, so the first batch of three temporary hospitals are set to take in patients uh, later uh, today and or early tomorrow. And uh, so the government has, uh, has announced that they are going to build another eight of such kind of temporary hospitals to offer more hospital beds. But just for the first batch of three hospitals are promising 3,800 hospital beds. And I paid a visit earlier into the hospital right behind me. The temporary hospital turned from a stadium. And that hospital is promising 800 hospital beds. But of course, it is not a five-star hotel inside. And these kind of makeshift or a temporary hospital, and what some people will call a mobile cap and hospital, uh, is only taking in confirmed uh, coronavirus patients with mild symptoms. Hmm. And during my earlier visit inside of the hospital, I didn't really see a lot of machines because some experts have been suggesting that for patients with mild symptoms, they do not need to be hooked up with machines right away. But if their condition wor uh, conditions worsen, they are going to be transferred into designated hospitals with better equipment here in the city that, you know, specially uh, treating coronavirus patients. Joe, yeah. Uh, we're also hearing uh, news that there is a shortage of testing kits. Are those patients staying in those makeshift hospitals being able to go through that screening process and confirm whether they have been infected or not? So what right now we're learning is like, including 
those makeshift hospitals. They were only taking confirmed cases of coronavirus. And right now, how that we're going to confirm that, that, uh, that if one individual have contracted the disease is through a test on the novel, uh, the novel coronavirus nucleate asset that you know requires the testing kits. But also there's another way to somewhat know if a patient is uh, contracting the, the disease is through a CD scan on the lung to see irregularity of their uh, lungs or to see those flu symptoms or fevers. Mm -hmm. but, but these patients are now only qualified or classified as a suspected cases. And uh, allegedly right now, the, including these makeshift hospitals, they are not taking in these suspected cases, but only confirmed cases. But speaking of testing cuts, and we know that a, a dozen of companies here in China, including uh, BGI from uh, uh, southern China, they are producing the cuts. And uh, so there is a strong production of the testing cuts and, and distributing across China. And I visited one of the testing labs uh, here in uh, uh, Wuhan city. It is a lab owned by Hebei General Hospital. And in fact, in that testing center, uh, they said they have a healthy storage of the testing kits, uh, over 1,200 kits, uh, uh, over, uh, over 1,200 kits, mm. over 12,000 kits to be because I'm sorry. And also the lab scientists told me that uh, they can run 1,000 tests per day. But as we know, they are just doing the tests. They are not collecting the samples. So the samples from patient throat or the nasal area actually done by fever clinics. But those fever clinics are running out of staff, as we know. And sometimes for a lab like uh, the one that in Hubei General Hospital that can do 1,000 tests a day, they can only get around 300 samples a day. Mm. So that some would you know, kind of uh, reduce the speed of uh, confirming patients with the coronavirus. All right. Uh, that says uh, how much strain there is on the medical system in Wuhan. And for some talks on, on the novel coronavirus, we're joined by Settler Links by Eric Ding, epidemiologist and health economist at Harvard School of Public Health, Professor Jonas Schmidt, uh, Shanasit, uh, chair of Arbor Biology of the Bernard Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine, and Babak Javid, tenured uh, principal investigator at Tsinghua University School of Medicine. Uh, so let me start with you, uh, Eric. Uh, what, what do you think it is the extent of the outbreak uh, so far? Because uh, since the lockdown of Wuhan, the epicenter on January the 23rd, we have seen uh, increasing numbers of cases of infection already is over 20,000 in, in China. Uh, is this uh, saying that we are now in entering a period of pandemic? I think we're getting pretty close to a pandemic. I think all the ex other experts are agreeing that this is potentially reaching a pandemic. It's the number of countries has increased and number of cases has increased outside the country. Um, you know, Southeast Asia especially and so I think it's getting to that point. But the pandemic, you need a little higher mortality. And so far, there's only been two uh, mortalities, I believe, outside of mainland China. So we're not quite at a pandemic yet, but the number of infections is starting to soar outside of China. And we have to be mm -hmm. very wary and careful of that. Uh, we, you know, we, SARS, it took um, three months to reach 8,000 uh, cases. We have reached 8,000 cases last week, and it only took one one month instead of three months for SARS. So this is a much faster trajectory. So we have to be very uh, uh, watchful. And Jonas, what is your assessment? I think we need, be, need to be really careful about this point. I mean, uh, 17 years since SARS, uh, the capacities, especially in China, are much more stronger to diagnose, to treat. So um, I think we are not at this point to decide it will really become a pandemic and uh, the containment was not, su not successful. We will see this, mm -hmm. I agree, in the next days or weeks, but so far we didn't observe or recognize any huge outbreak outside mainland China. So uh, if this happened, uh, in, in the days I, I agreed with Eric that, that then, then we will see for sure a pandemic, and we have to change the measure because then we cannot contain the virus. We have to focus on the treatment of the severely ill patients. This will be the main focus then. Babak, what is your take? 
I, I agree with, uh, with, with my colleagues. Um, I don't think we're at a pandemic yet, but it's very likely we'll be there soon. The only slightly puzzling issue is that we're not getting sustained secondary transmission outside of China. We are definitely getting more and more cases of human to human transmission outside of China, mm. but uh, those are not sort of running away out of control as far as we know. Of course, there may well be cases bubbling away in more resource poor settings which have got less active surveillance. Um, and uh, I think that's the real concern where, you know, if that's the case, we, we definitely will have lost containment, but we won't know that information for at least another few more days or weeks even. And, and do we know better, Babak, better about the trans transmission methods of this new strain of coronavirus, why it is being spread so fast in such a short span of time? Yeah. Uh, I, if I can well, volunteer I, an I answer don't think we have all the There's answers. Uh, uh, Abek, please first, and then Eric, please. Yeah, sure. Sorry, yes. So I don't think we have all the answers. The, the, the transmission dynamics even within China seem to vary. Within Hubei, we're, still, we're seeing very the number of confirmed cases is just going up, but that may be a backlog because there's so many background cases. It's just a function of the number of tests that are being performed uh, and the number of people that are infected in Hubei. Um, but uh, the initial uh, projections of how fast this virus was, spread it, was spreading from the, you know, within Wuhan made it more transmissible, for example, than influenza. But that's not what we're seeing outside of China mm. for now. So uh, why there is a difference between within China and outside being. China? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Why there is a huge difference in, in terms of cases of infection within China and outside China? Is it because the lockdown of the epicenter? Difficult to say. It may be people with, you know, pollution makes people more susceptible. It may be to do with hand hygiene practices. I, I, don't, know, I don't know the answer, but it's a puzzle. Okay, Eric, what, what is your, what is your uh, opinion on the transmissibility? Yeah. Yeah, so the transmission is tricky because there's also a controversy. Unlike SARS, SARS was only transmittable once you had symptoms, fever, coughing, etc. But with this case, there's a controversy whether you, this will transmit even when you don't have any symptoms. Mm. And uh, I know that there was a discussion in Munich, but that woman turned out to have symptoms. But there's other cases in China in which th there was transmission even without symptoms, which would make containment much more difficult than SARS and also why, w explains why this is rising so much faster than SARS did. Um, and outside of, outside of mainland China, there could be surveillance bias um, because oftentimes their t criteria for testing is have you traveled to China? Have you been in contact with someone in China? And if you only ask those questions, you might not pick up all the cases that have the secondary transmission as mm. I was that we're looking for. So we, it's, it's really still a wait and see. I think rapid tests are, are coming out on the horizon soon, and hopefully we'll, in a good uh, you know, public health infrastructure, we'll have a good surveillance system for secondary transmission outside of China. And Jonah's talking about those uh, who are asymptomatic but still carry the viruses. Germany has uh, seen cases there. What do you say to that? This is a very crucial question. I completely agree with Eric. So if this is confirmed as a main mode of transmission, so not only single cases, as a main mode of transmission, this means containment would be not possible anymore because then we miss a lot of cases. It is far more widespread than we see now because mostly symptomatic cases are tested, isolated. This would completely change the situation. Um, However, I didn't see this point yet. We have to may, uh, wait a few more days to draw any conclusions on this. And, and also, uh, we have uh, tested some of the feces of those patients, and already uh, there are signs of nucleic acid tested in the feces of those patients. Uh, could that be also a source of transmission? This is not unexpected. We have the same uh, results for other viruses. So uh, PCR detection not necessarily means that it can be transmitted. So we have to wait for the isolation study if this virus is really con still contagious. 
Um, and then we really have to think if this might be a, a, a source of a contagion thesis. So uh, it might be important, however, the information is at this today is very limited. Uh, however, we cannot exclude this at this time point. Uh, here, here in China, people are expecting that this will uh, level off very soon because the 14-day incubation period has already passed. Uh, why, can we see a stability of the situation in, in a matter of weeks, uh, Eric? Um, that's really hard to say. The, the, first of all, the, the quarantine in China is for a whole city. It's not a quarantine. Traditional Actually, it's quarantine for the whole province. For one family. Yeah, uh, for the whole province, exactly. So just by locking up everyone together, uh, it's, it's hard to say, because we'll, we'll, that's not a tr conventional quarantine. Quarantine is for one family. So ma that could actually just increase um, exposure within the city as well. We have to wait and see. I, d I do not see the curve plateauing yet. So um, I'm not sure we're at uh, reaching a peak in those areas. Uh, the numbers, there's, again, there's such a backlog of tests. There's so, so much evidence that milder cases are being turned away and just not being tested. So we don't have good data on that. I think all the experts mm. saying it will continue for at least three or four more weeks. And Bebek, uh, do you think the lockdown of, of a huge city like Wuhan actually helped contain the virus or there be uh, complicating factors involved? I mean, there's no precedent in history of uh, basically isolating a population of 60 million people. So we're in totally unknown territory here. Uh, if, if, there's, uh, if this virus is able to spread when you've got very mild symptoms or asymptomatically, then I think um, I don't think containment is possible, no matter what you know what we try to do. So if we can, you know, as we know, before the lockdown occurred, a significant proportion of the population uh, left Wuhan. So, uh, so again, it depends on how many people were actually infected at that point in time, uh, not the confirmed cases, the actual number of cases. So. Um, uh, again, I think we're in totally unknown territory here. There is something puzzling about this, for me anyway, that yep. I think that um, the dynamics and the severity we're seeing in Hubei seems to be distinct to what we're seeing in the rest of China and definitely t to the rest of the world. What's driving that? Is it because there's just so much pressure on in infrastructure? Is it because the epidemic just started there, so we're seeing a lag? Uh, it could be those factors and many other unknowns still. And, and also about the uh, mobility rates, because uh, in the m mortality rates, actually. Uh, the mortality rates in Wuhan is much higher than the rest in China, uh, let alone the rest of the world. Uh, why there is a gap of mortality rate, and, and will that mortality rate m remain in, in the coming month, Eric? I think mortality rate takes time to catch up. The virus has been in Wuhan much longer, so a lot of people go into intensive care. I think there was a report that of the people that are seen in the hospital, 25% needed to go into intensive care of some sort. And that's a very high number. And if they're in intensive care, it takes, you mm -hmm. know, then these people in Wuhan would have higher mortality over time. But, but you know, it's spread later to the rest of the China and, and the rest of the world. So. Uh, I think the disease progression has not caught up yet, so it could still go up. I, it's really too early to calculate the case fatality ratio. And, and Jonas, uh, and also the treatment, uh, it seems that uh, nearly a thousand patients have uh, been cured and discharged from hospitals. Is this a good sign? Uh, because most of them haven't been uh, receiving a lot of treatment in hospitals, and there isn't any effective treatment so far. I is that right? Yes, mostly, I, I completely agree. Mostly it's, an asympt uh, it's a symptomatic treatment. However, uh, uh, clinical trials are ongoing with remdesivir, for example. So we really have to wait for those results with um, these new drugs. And I'm also very looking forward for the new vaccine candidates when they will be in place. There are uh, uh, huge vaccine aliens like C CP. Um, so it might be, uh, take some time, so I'm not talking about days uh, or mm. weeks, more, more months. However, um, it's on the horizon, on the horizon. So we, we really have to wait. It's too early to say if this really have an effect now.
So what is the best way of uh, taking care of those uh, sick people right now in Wuhan? Because obviously the, dem the um, demand outstrip uh, the capacity to, to take care of them, accommodate their need. What, what should be happening? Uh, Eric and, yes, and as, also as, Babak. As discussed before, for the really severe Yes, uh, for the severely ill patient, it's a symptomatic individual tr treatment in the ICU. So you need to have enough capacity that while the new hospitals are set up, this is very crucial. And especially we have in Wuhan, we deal with a lot of severely ill patients. This is mm -hmm. crucial. So uh, we cannot compare the situation in Wuhan with outside China, even with other cities of China. And the factors that led to this high amount of severely ill patients is still not clear what are the factors. So uh, this is what we discussed here, and uh, we really have to wait uh, a few more weeks and days to get an answer for our question. I, I want your take on the Eric and also Babak because now the system in Wuhan is like this. There is first a quarantine centers. They go through a screening system and then they go to certain makeshift hospitals and then they go to specialized hospitals. Is is this uh, the right way to do do it, uh, Eric? Um, I think the triaging system is good. I, I, I've heard they're also expanding the number of. Uh, uh, hospitals just for mild cases. So I think that you do need hospitals that handle the mild and the intense. Um, the, the, I really give them props for building the hospitals so quickly. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, you know, you need sufficient testing. And it, I think the testing volume still has to catch up. And the intensive care, when I heard the 25% are intensive care in some of these hospitals, that was quite shocking. But but, you know, I don't think it, it's that many who will truly get in intensive care if you truly calculate the total cases. Um, you know, I, I'm really praying for the people in Wuhan because they're going to going so much in the health systems and the health care workers. And also, I really respect that all the, uh, there's so many clinical trials. I counted at least half a dozen or more in Wuhan that are doing these trials on to find a vaccine and treatment. So I really, really admire their, their, uh, their contribution. Babak, what is your opinion on the treatment and the medical care level now? I mean, I, th I think obviously in Wuhan and Hubei in general, the infrastructure is under intense pressure. And we have to also uh, remember that the symptoms for this novel coronavirus are pretty much indistinguishable from influenza or even the common cold in some cases. I think that triage is absolutely critical. And in fact, if people uh, you know, ha, uh, have got very mild symptoms. I, my personal view is that they shouldn't be attending healthcare facilities mm. because a they may not have the virus and may get infected within the healthcare facility. And secondly, unless they need medical treatment, i.e., oxygen or other supportive treatments, mm. um, it, it, it's it's uh, you know I'm not sure being in hospital helps. Uh, Self quarantine would be more useful in that regard. Uh, and, I, and um, you know, as, as, as the other commentators have already said, the situation in Hubei is totally different to anywhere else in China or, or the world because in, in other healthcare facilities, there may be, <coughs> you know, one or two patients mm. per hospital clinic. This is just not the case in Wuhan or in Hubei in general. Uh, and I think that triage, uh, prioritizing care of actually sick, severely ill and sick patients uh, is critical uh, and let's not forget that there will at the same time as there are maybe 10 15 thousand confirmed cases of this novel coronavirus mm. in Wuhan there'll be just as many or more cases of seasonal influenza in Wuhan at the same time um, which will present with similar symptoms so I think you know it's really important to prioritize care for those that need it most and people here in China are really worried about uh uh, how those patients can be treated. Uh, there are debates about certain treatments and, and drugs. For example, the remdesivir uh, developed by uh, Gilead and also some Chinese traditional medicines uh, have been uh, proposed to, to, to be used for those patients. I want your gentleman's takes on the effectiveness of those drugs. Uh, let, let me start with, with you, uh, Jonas. Yes. Maybe I can say something of remdesivir. So we have very limited data from clinical trials. So um, mostly data from 
um, in vitro studies, so um, we cannot conclude that it might help in the patient. So we really have to wait for the data from those clinical trials, including hundreds of patients, to draw any conclusions if it might be beneficial to the severely ill. So we're just talking about <coughs> the severely ill patient on the ICU. What I, I completely agree that uh, the people showing mild symptoms, they should stay at home and, uh, uh, and not go into the hospitals because the capacities are mm. so limited in Wuhan. So they need the capacity for the severely ill patients. So that's about uh, remdesivir. There are other uh, 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 drugs, uh, HIV drugs, for example, protease inhibitors that might be beneficial. But again, we have to wait for the outcome of those clinical trials running now uh, in Wuhan. Eric, you, do, you agree that we shouldn't rush it because there is such a huge need? Yeah, you should never rush treatments. Uh, I'm all for evidence-based medicine, and I think we need to wait for the trials. But I think there, there are a lot of... Um, antiviral drugs that are being tested and you can uh, and they've they've been registered I saw them there's like four or five of them registered just in the past week so I'm very hopeful that we could uh, get some results within a couple months and Babak I, I mean, I, I don't have a lot to add. I think I agree with uh, what everything's been said. Uh, you know, showing activity in the test tube is not the same as being able to help a patient. And we really need uh, robust uh, uh, trials to be able to evaluate that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't be implementing those trials now. Uh, we should. Um, uh, but I think uh, it's uh, too early to say whether any one therapy is going to prove to be um, you know, better than just uh, supportive therapy. Well, what about at this the traditional stage? Chinese medicines uh, that Ch the doctors are using that seems to be uh, helpful in, 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 in fighting the virus? In theory, there's, it's possible. The problem um, is but the, the standardization. Evidence, the evidence just isn't there right now. Mm -hmm. There is no clinical data proving it's 100% effective, right? So, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. So exactly, you, and uh, one problem is... Yes, go yes. ahead, Jonas. Yes, the problem is, I think, the standardization. So if you can isolate the, uh, 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 or characterize the compound like the artesimazine, it might be able to have a very pure uh, a compound that can be applied. Uh, but this is not the case yet, so this uh, 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 active account need to be uh, characterized, isolated, and then it might be helpful. And mm. in this way, uh, the traditional Chinese medicine could be helpful. And, and very briefly, each one of you, what do you think is the time frame for this to go away? Jonas? Uh, we're not talking about days, so we're talking about months for sure. Eric? I think it will take at least six to nine months. This could potentially become endemic, like the flu annually. So I'm really hoping it won't be, but I, I see that as a potential fear if we don't control it. And Babak? I, I'm the same with Eric. I think uh, this may fizzle down in the spring, but it's probably going to come back in the autumn. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for your take on this. Eric, Babak, and Jonas, thank you. And we're watching dialogue here on CGTM. I'm Zoe in Beijing. Thanks so much for watching. Goodbye.